Good evening, and welcome to the candidate forum for the Sheboygan Area School District Board Candidates. I'm Dulce Johnson, a member of the Sheboygan branch of the American Association of University Women, the sponsor of tonight's event. AAUW's mission is to advance equity for women and girls through advocacy, education, and research. We are a nonpartisan organization. We do not endorse candidates at any level of government, but do take positions on issues concerning education and women. AAUW was instrumental in getting Title IX passed and the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act. Locally, we give scholarships to non-traditional women students. We co-sponsored the Great Decisions series with the Mead Public Library and will conduct our sixth annual STEM conference in November to encourage girls to consider careers in science, technology, education, and math. New members are always welcome to join us in our mission uh, and information is available on our website. This is not a debate. There will be no rebuttals. It is simply an opportunity for candidates to inform the public of their opinions on issues related to the Sheboygan Area School District. The moderator for tonight's event is AEUW member Mary Jo McGurtry. Mary Jo has been moderating the SASD forums for several years and we think she's the perfect person to do this because she doesn't live in the Sheboygan district. <laughs> Our timekeepers are Eleanor Young and Kathy Lowen. Mary Jo. Thank you, Dulcie, and thank you all for being here. To begin, please briefly introduce yourselves. We will start and then rotate in alphabetical order who answers questions first. You have one minute for this introductory statement, and we will start with Heidi Bamer. I'm a parent of three SASD kids and am active in their learning and school life. I'm a former classroom teacher and education consultant. As a consultant, I worked with schools in curriculum review and best practice implementations, so I know how to find and synthesize education research because this is where solutions lie. I love learning and I'm eager to learn the many aspects of the work required to serve effectively on our school board, to listen to the students, parents, teachers, and staff, and to work with fellow members of the board to come to unified decisions. I'm honored to run for the open seat vacated by David Gallinetti after his many, many years of service to our school community. And I'm grateful to the American Association of U University Women for this opportunity to share my views. Thank you. Julie. I was waiting for it. Okay. Hi. Thank you for hosting this event tonight. Um, also, thank you for hosting this event for the voters as well. I really appreciate this opportunity. To step outside my comfort zone and be heard. So my name is Julie Kelly. I am happily married, uh, mother of five. I am employed at Lakeshore Display. I am also, also employed at the village of one, at 170. Um, I attended Sheboygan Area School District from my very first school days through high school, including Stribe and TAP, the teenage parent program. Um, all five of my kiddos have attended the district in the past. <clears throat> a healthy academic setting for our children is very near and dear. To my heart. Um, so I'm forewarning as I may get emotional at times. Time. So please be patient while I regroup when necessary. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I want to thank the AAUW for hosting this important event. And I say good evening to everyone who had the courage to come out in iffy weather, so thank you. My name is Kay Robbins and I am currently on the SASD school board. I want to continue to serve because I've spent the majority of my life involved in public education and it remains my area of greatest interest. This passion for education inspires me to want to give back. 
My university experience includes a bachelor's degree in education from UW-Madison and a master's degree in education from Lakeland University. I am a teacher to my core, having taught 40 years in the Sheboygan Area School District. I believe in this school district. Our schools, all 25 of them, create powerful learning environments for our 10,000, almost 10,000 students. We provide opportunities that few other districts can match. I look forward to working together with all stakeholders to make our schools even better. Thank you. Thank you. David. My thoughts are basically that you would get to know me a little bit. Is this on? Wait. Till okay, can I still have my minute? Okay. Yeah, I'm Dave Ross. I uh, was born and raised in Sheboygan. My wife and I have three kids and four grandkids that have come up mostly through Sheboygan schools. Uh, during my school years, I enjoyed being involved in choirs and swing choirs. Uh, later, as I entered the workforce, one of my memorable jobs was working for H.C. Prangy Company, where many people in our county would shop and congregate. I have connected in our community as a soccer coach, uh, rec department supervisor, visiting my children's classrooms in the SASD, leading a youth group, volunteering at South High, and I brought music to the Salvation Army for their morning services. Currently, I'm involved as a ministry volunteer for Sheboygan County Jail Visitation. I would just like to be involved to provide the best educational experience for the kids in our district. Thank you. Sarah. I tend to go. <clears throat> Hola, buenas noches. Hello, everyone. My name is Sarah Ruiz Harrison. I was born and raised in Sheboygan, and I'm a direct product of SASD. Um, my SASD education provided me with many unique opportunities. I went to James Madison Elementary School, Horseman Middle School, and I graduated from South High. I have a bachelor's degree in business administration from Cardinal Stretch University and an associate's degree in human resources, business administration from Western Wisconsin Technical College. I am uniquely positioned to grow engagement as an active citizen with the whole district and I'm uniquely motivated to work with the growing diverse communities in Sheboygan. Currently, I am a branch manager at Fox Communities Credit Union, where I oversee two branch locations. My career path has allowed me to utilize sound finance and business skills daily to prioritize resources and develop budgets. I am currently on the Sheboygan Area School District Board, and I want to make sure that our teachers continue to have the resources they need to ensure all students succeed. Haley. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Hello, my name is Haley Stuckman. I attended Sheboygan Area School District from pre-K through my graduation as an honor student in 2021. During my senior year of high school, I completed my first year of college and made Dean's List. In May of 2022, I graduated with my associate degree in horticulture business management. By the time I was three years old, I had been in five foster homes before landing safely in my forever home, the Stuckman family household. Due to the events of my early childhood, I struggled, and if I'm being honest, I continue to struggle, but I think we all do in one way or another. And because hindsight is 2020, I realize how important it is for students to attend a school that fosters a safe, healthy, and stable environment. I want that for the students of this district, and I want students to be pre prepared for life after high school. I want to be a part of helping return this district to its former glory. Thank you. All right, <clears throat> to begin, this is a three-part question. Why are you running? What are your primary qualifications to be a school board member? And what is the one best thing that you can contribute to the district? You have three minutes for this question, starting with Julie Kelly. All righty. Okay. So this is an interesting and sensitive topic. So it all started in 2020. Uh, when my husband and I attended an emergency community input board meeting the night before the first day of school in support of our community. All right, end of that subject. So, like many other parents and SASD staff who reside in the district, we chose to a district that aligned more with our morals and values. While my husband and I, as well as our children, have been very pleased um, with our decision, we still stood in support for staff, students, and friends of the district. I believe our school community is in dire need of new leadership um, with declining enrollment, poor attendance, teacher shortage, student mental health issues, and 
in some cases far below average academic achievement. Um, those need to be addressed at some of our re really great, once really great schools. I would like to be the eyes ears and a voice for parents who may not be aware of what is being taught to their children or who also uh, may be fearful of speaking up about anything. I also want to make sure our teachers are supported as they help their students consistently be accountable on a regular basis. Um, I think there are too many divisive distractions going on not pertaining to academics, taking up valuable time that could be spent on the betterment of the entire student body. Um, and my primary, can you repeat the second part? What's the one Sorry. best thing that you can contribute to the district? Um, so I think what I would be able to contribute is that I've been a mom of 32 years um, with a passion for academic excellence. I just want to make sure that the students in our community uh, are afforded that. They're afforded that opportunity for academic excellence. They deserve that. Thank Kay. you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'd say one of my primary qualifications is that I have taught in a lot of different levels at a lot of different schools under a lot of different circumstances. And that came during my retirement life uh, as I became a substitute teacher for the school district. For the first 35 years, I taught at South High School. And it remains a joy of my life to walk out in public and see how incredibly well these graduates have done. I'm, yeah, I got a wave in the back there. Uh, I'm gonna maintain that we have a very good school district. We have challenges, yes, so does every urban school district in America. But we are doing a lot of things really well, and I invite you, if you don't know that, to walk into one of the schools. We welcome you. As a board member, you're welcome. Please come, they're your schools. Observe, be a part of it. Uh, if you had a chance last week to see the music exchange group that came from South Africa, they were absolutely amazing and the experience that our children got in that was life-changing. Uh, I am a parent of four children. Uh, my oldest is 42, our youngest is 22. Along the way, we've had kids who loved school and kids who struggled in school. Uh, but they've all made it and they've all been successful because they came from a home where that was supported and they went to a school district where it was supported. And I think there are a lot of things that we can do to make that the case for lots of kids. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in detail, about how the school district steps up and helps kids who may not have as much support as home as the people in this room. Uh, one of my kids was a valedictorian. One of my kids was in special ed. One of my kids was adopted from a foreign country. Uh, one of my kids was a big athlete. And he only went to school to play ball. Uh, so, you know, we've had a wide variety of experiences in our own home. I now have three beautiful grandchildren and I am enjoying supporting them in their schooling. Uh, and I particularly did that during COVID when their mom, who was also a teacher, was teaching online and I was helping them. Thank you. David. Thank you. I, I am actually running because I feel like we're coming after kids with ideology that is removing moral standards and good judgment. Libraries are dispensing pornography without parental knowledge in the name of including all experiences. We're suggesting to the kids that the biological sex they were born with is subject to change based on their feelings. We're allowing the notion that America is foundationally racist and asking students to identify their part in it. And of course, and I won't try to change this, we teach our children that the perfect order of the universe happened because of a random big bang. So why the war on children? We accept any new ideology that comes along, and I think that undermines their security. Why are many schools rejecting these things? And I believe that we really need to make, uh, to use good judgment. My qualifications, I feel that as a parent, grandparent, and a volunteer in the community, I've been through many scenarios that will definitely help me make decisions. And I got boom, two minutes. Hmm. Uh, I think I can contribute good listening skills, uh, a team player, uh, in encouraging all parents' voices and uh, considering all voices when coming to crucial matters regarding 
curriculum and policy. Thank you very much. Sarah. <clears throat> Can you repeat the question again? Pardon me? Can you repeat the question again? Yes, a three-part question. Why are you running? What are your primary qualifications to be a school board member? And what is the one best thing you can contribute to the district? Wonderful, thank you. It's kind of a long question, so. Um, why am I? Um, about 10 to 12 years ago, uh, I was living in Milwaukee, finishing up school. And at that time, my husband and I were dating, and I said, I'm gonna move back to Sheboygan because I love Sheboygan. And I think all of us can say we're up here because we love Sheboygan. Um, so back then, my husband, Tim, back there, one of my biggest supporters, um, moved back to Sheboygan. And I love everything about it. Um, I believe in the Sheboygan Area School District vision that all students will be productive and responsible citizens in a competitive world. I'm a direct product of what SASD is. Um, I have held a variety of volunteer leadership roles in my church right down the street at St. Clement's Catholic Church. Um, I was a First Communion uh, teacher, confirmation coordinator. Um, now in my career right now, I, I manage two branches and um, I oversee 18 employees. So I know that um, what it takes to be a leader, I know what it takes to be a servant leader. Um, we're all in this together and um, I believe in the kids, and I believe in Sheboygan, and I believe that if we have a successful school district, we have a successful community. Haley. Thank you. Can you repeat the question one more time? <laughs> <laughs> Why are you running? What are your primary qualifications to be a school board member? And what is the one best thing you can contribute to the district? Okay. Um, well, first of all, I am running because I am, I just got done spending 12 years of my life in this district and I'm not taking digs at the district whatsoever, but I did firsthand, I, I witnessed the deterioration of this district and I also experienced it and I want to be a part in changing that back because I remember even in grade school, it was much different by the, than by the time I graduated. Um, my primary qualifications, I guess it would be that I, I did just graduate. I can speak as to what happens in the classroom on a daily basis where there's a lot of people, I don't think there's anybody on the board that has been able to sit in a classroom every single day. And it's been a while since they've done that and um, there are some appalling things going on in the classes that we don't talk about, that nobody knows about, uh, except maybe students and teachers and that doesn't even go around. And the best thing I can contribute, I think, is I can be a voice for everybody. I can be a voice for the parents. I can be a voice for the students. And we need young representation on this board because they're, they're students that they want to say and what's going on. And I really feel like I can be that voice. Thank you. Thank you. Next, qu <clears throat> next question. What are the most important challenges facing the district Yes? I'm afraid I didn't have a chance to answer. I'm sorry? I didn't have a chance to answer that oh, question. I apologize. I'm very sorry. I got out of alphabetical order. That's all right. My bad. My bad. Sorry. That's all right. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm running because I love this community. My husband and I had a chance to live um, anywhere we chose to, and we chose Sheboygan. Um, partially for the diversity. We have um, a multi-ethnic family and we really loved the diversity we found here in Sheboygan. Um, we loved how beautiful it is, in the summer at least. And um, we, we really want to be involved and we have invested ourselves in this community. Um, I'm running because I have three kids in the district and I always want the best for them, and I want the best for their friends, and I want the best for our neighbors. I want the best for the kids in this community. My qualifications are, first as a parent, um, who's very active in my kids' learning. I'm also an active volunteer in our community with a refugee resettlement. Um, I'm a Sunday school teacher and a service project coordinator for the kids in our church. I'm also a former teacher and an education consultant, so I understand the business of education, which is a bit different than um, just seeing it from the perspective of a parent or a student, and perhaps even as a teacher. Um, I think the best thing I can bring as a candidate is my ability to listen. I know how to ask the questions, and I know how to really receive what people have to tell me. 
I engage with youth and I engage with the teachers already. And I'm eager to work with people on the board. I know how to find consensus. So I think the thing I can bring is using the research skills I have to not try to reinvent the wheel. Everyone is dealing with the kind of situations we're dealing with. And we can use the research that is out there to see what is working elsewhere. I know how to find and synthesize that with the needs that our community is are experiencing. Thanks. Thank you. And sorry again for my interruption there. No problem. All right, next. What are the most important challenges facing the district? And what are your priorities for meeting these challenges? Two minutes, starting with Kay Robbins. Well, there are a couple to choose from, uh, but if I had to pick just one to start with, I would say the most important challenge facing us is attracting and retaining quality teachers. This is a nationwide problem. It is not a reflection on the Sheboygan Area School District. Fewer and fewer people are going into teaching and we're losing a large percentage of them in the first five years. So what can we do as a priority to fix that? The first thing costs absolutely nothing and it's called respect. If we treat our teachers with respect, if we encourage them, if we believe in them, they're gonna do a better job. I don't know if negativity has ever motivated you, but it doesn't work with me. And the second thing is very practical. We need to pay people more money for a degree that takes them a minimum of four and a half years and potentially five to get through university. Some people who really want to do this work simply cannot afford to. And uh, they shouldn't have to be going to a restaurant or Menards after school to pay back their loans. So whatever we can do to encourage the attraction of high quality teachers and to keep the ones we have, that's, that's my number one priority. Uh, secondly, we are all working at rebounding from COVID and getting our achievement back up. And we're doing some really good things. We have interventionists in our elementary school. If you don't know what they do, go and watch them. They're impressive. We have smaller class sizes in our schools that have the most struggle. And we have a really positive, effective summer school program. So I think those things are in place and I prioritize supporting those. Uh, and then some of the challenges we have are just unique to this community. And I don't know how many people are aware of this. We are the fourth most economically disadvantaged school district in the state of Wisconsin. That may not be clear to us because we live a middle class life, but many of our kids are living in poverty. And so meals at school, wraparound care before and after school, supporting the Boys and Girls Club, it's all good stuff. Thank you. David, could you repeat that please? Pardon me? Could you repeat the question please? What are the most important challenges facing the district and what are your priorities for meeting these challenges? Okay, thank you. Uh, l let me say this. I know several teachers, uh, and they are a frustrated bunch. Uh, it seems that student cell phone addiction in the classroom, unchecked classroom disruptions are really thwarting their abilities to teach. So I would really want to address that. Um, I, as it's been stated, some teachers are leaving after only one year of service. I would like to problem solve with teachers and administrators and try to offer a safe, rewarding environment for our teachers. Uh, the thought has been stated that possibly teachers could get paid based on merit and that maybe there would be an easier path to terminate underachievers. Thank you. Sarah. Um. I think there is um, a couple of problems that we have that I think uh, we can, can solve. Um, the first one is teacher retention. Um, as we know, in every sector of every public or private, it is hard to retain employees. We're fighting one for another because somebody's paying somebody else a better living wage. Um, and we can do something about that in our community. We can step, and step up and say, our teachers are worth it and pay them more. Um, the second thing uh, I would say would be funding. Um, I, I was looking at some statistics and I was very appalled to notice that we spent $2 million in vouchers um, that were taken out of the public school sector and given to private schools in this city. A lot of people are saying that we have declining numbers the truth of the matter of the fact is that 
majority of the schools in the state are declining in numbers. Just um, the six districts within Sheboygan County are, are lower in, in enrollment. Um, and then the other, the other issue that I see is we are the four, fourth poorest um, district in the state. We are the fourth poorest district in the state. Um, and, and we have to watch out, we have to look out for our kids. Um, so being able to be on the board, because I am currently on the board, um, we have funded free breakfast, free lunches in the elementary and middle school um, so that the kids can, can focus when they're in class. So thank you. Thank you. Haley. Thank you. That's actually a very good question because I think there's always going to be challenges. Uh, my primary concern, I guess, is that I think that we are not adequately preparing our students for life after high school. And at the end of the day, children are our most valuable resource in this community. And I know that negativity can be really uncomfortable sometimes, but also truth and transparency. Are, <laughs> the, everybody in our community deserves that long before we think about how we feel. And declining numbers started before COVID. And I think that's something that a lot of people don't realize. But I mean, we aren't adequately preparing our students. There's been a 10.3% drop in graduation rates since 2017. We're below average in ELA math and reading scores. Um, you're just another one. Let's see. We are also below average in achievement, growth, and for our on track to graduate students. I mean, there are a lot of issues here, and this started long before COVID. I know that we we want to use a we want to use COVID as a crutch, and I understand that. I think that it did impact us greatly, but that, that's not the only reason that we're here. Thank you. Thank you. Heidi. Thank you. Um, I would agree that attracting and retaining quality is really a challenge. Um, research shows that, um, excuse me, um, that teachers leave the job due to poor leadership, poor working condition, and counterproductive policies. We need to ask our teachers anonymously if these are their reasons for leaving our district and look for the solutions um, to meet their needs. I don't know why our particular teachers are leaving. I would love to hear their exit interviews. I would like to know what are the things. Um, is it just finances? What I hear talking to my friends, it's not just pay. It is um, respect from students. It's respect um, from this community in general. And um, I'm eager to understand more when I can um, read more research about what teachers are saying when they leave. I think emotional well-being for our students, our teachers, and our staff is impacting academic growth. It's impacting emotional um, behavior in classes. And as someone who is trauma-informed, I'm eager to support more social and emotional learning strategies um, to help our students face um, the, the trauma that they have experienced. Thank you. Julie. Um, so I think the most important challenge will be helping our youth get caught up in their academics. Um, I think that's so important as they are our future leaders. They're gonna be you know, leading stuff in our community. Um, I would love to help brainstorm ideas that help bridge the gap between school and home. I think that our public schools um, need to operate as such, traditional public schools. Um, go back to investing and expecting excellence and mastery of academic learning in core subjects. Um, I think then you'll start to see student enrollment go back up, as well as top talented teachers. But the most important transformation we'll see is, is that academic uh, achievement soaring. Um, again, supporting our teachers also um, to help the students be con to be accountable um, for their actions. Things like, again, cell phone use. I've heard this as well, how some districts, you know, are pretty strict about not using the cell phone and I've heard that this district 
is not. Now, of course, this is coming from students and their friends, my, my students, friends, so I, you know, saying they use their cell phones all the time. I don't know how you, I cannot, I can't do it. I can't use my cell phone and focus on something, so that definitely should not be an issue or, or a distraction. Um, I'm sorry, I have so many different notes here. Um, all right. <clears throat> Yeah, so I think yeah. I think that's okay. That's next, all I all right. have. Next, Thank you. next question: What kind of training should teachers, staff, and administration receive to ensure that all students are treated equally and that all interactions are appropriate with all students? You have two minutes, starting with David. Mm. What kind of training should they receive? Uh, I haven't done. I didn't know the questions beforehand, of course, so I haven't done too much research on that. But I do have some thoughts when you describe, and, and I think you did, uh, diversity, possibly, uh, equity, inclusion. The, the question, the training to ensure that all students are treated equally and that all interactions are appropriate. Equally and appropriate. Um, okay, can you give me one second? and appropriately. Um, I guess I, I can offer you what I prepared that I think is close to that. Um, I believe that Wigan Area School District does have a positive record of being uh, uh, diverse, equitable, and including people of all backgrounds, races, genders, um, ethnicity, and that we are, I, I would believe that we're good at, uh, at including everybody and treating everybody uh, uh, fairly. Um, so uh, I, I, know I believe that it exists. I do not have any information on what training they should receive. I guess that's where I get off here. Okay. Sarah? Um, <clears throat> I believe um, equitable education comes to us from all different walks of life. We have children who come to work um, with, or, I'm sorry, come to school with Mental, mental health issues. They come from broken homes. They come from um, being hungry the, the, the night before. Um, and all of these um, come with them to school every day. We just have to make sure that we hold uh, our teachers accountable, our staff accountable. Um, we have to make sure that we're building the relationships with the parents, the teachers, the school district, um, and that we value every kid equally. Um, we need to treat everyone with respect, um, and, and that's how I think that, um, that there'll be uh, equity within our students. Haley. Can you repeat the question one more time? <laughs> What kind of training should teachers, staff, and administration receive to ensure that all students are treated equally and that all interactions are appropriate? Uh, well, I will just be transparent. I'm not familiar with any specific trainings that we do in the Sheboygan Area School District because I'm not on the board, <laughs> but I would love to learn more about that. But I do know that Sheboygan is fortunate, fortunate enough to be extremely diverse, um, people from all sorts of situations, experiences, demographic differences, you know, we're all in the same place. And I think that at the end of the day, the goal needs to be that everybody has the same opportunity and everybody is treated the same no matter any of those differences. Um, and also what somebody previously mentioned was that the relationship with parents, I think that definitely should be part of those trainings that the parents know what's going on in the schools and um, there's that communication between the teachers and the parents. Thank you. Okay, Heidi. Equity training is about finding what each kid needs to thrive. Culture, cultural respect and understanding is so important for emotional well-being and community building. In schools, it helps kids have a way to talk about how they learn and to understand how other people think and that other people think differently than they do, and yet they still deserve our respect. Our student population is now more people of color than white kids. And every kid's cultural, linguistic, re and religious background needs to be valued so that every kid feels valued. 
I was thinking about this with um, a few of the Rohingya kids that I was tutoring this week. In Rohingya culture, when there are authority figures in the room, children are supposed to look down. They're not supposed to make eye contact. So if the teachers and the staff don't understand that those children are showing respect by not making eye contact, there is a misunderstanding and possibly a consequence for a kid who is not communicating the same way their teachers are. And we now have 30 or 40 Rohingya kids in our school district, and I just am so excited that the teachers that I've met are so eager to learn about the cultures of the kids in their room. They want to know about them. They want to be able to communicate with their families. So I don't think it's hard to encourage teachers, staff, and administrators to, um, to gain this equity training. Everybody wants it. We want to do the best for what's in the kids in our classrooms. Thanks. Julie. All right, can you repeat the question one more time? Thank you, sorry. <clears throat> What kind of training should teachers, staff, and administration receive to ensure that all students are treated equally and that all interactions are appropriate with all students? Okay, thank you for that question. That's a great question. So while I myself am not aware of any training that they have or what the training entails in the district, however, I do believe um, that every student should be treated equally. They should, every single student should have um, equal opportunity um, to soar in their academics. I think I would, um, I don't know, when I think about this, I guess I revert back to um, the number one, you know, rule in kindergarten. If it doesn't make you feel good, it's not going to make anybody else feel good. Um, so I don't. I guess I'm a little confused about all this extensive training about including everybody. Aren't we already including everybody? So I guess I. I think that I. It's really simple. Um, I guess to that I would say, um, like <laughs> the great Ronald Reagan. They say the world has become too complex for simple answers. They are wrong. That's it. Thank you. Okay. We had a uh, diversity, inclusion, and equity training going pretty well right before the uh, uh, pandemic hit. And then suddenly we had a lot of fires to put out, and so we did. Uh, but I think right now we're, we're making our way back, and I would assume that toward the end of this school year and the beginning of the next school year, we will bring that back at full force because in our school district, it is extremely important. Uh, as, as Heidi indicated, you know, we have a lot more kids from a lot different backgrounds than when you and I went to school. I started teaching here in 1976. <laughs> there were no black students. There were no Asian students. There were five students who were from Hispanic families who then in the winter went to Texas and came back to us in the spring. Sheboygan has become a richer, more involved, dynamic community. I say, look at our restaurants. You know, it's just a much better place to raise your kids to get them ready to go out in a global economy. We are a reflection of a bigger society, and I'm proud of that. It does create some issues. Everybody doesn't understand. Uh, and when you teach people a simple thing like the eye contact, which we did with our Hmong students back in the first group of Hmong students that came through, it was exactly that. You know, we were brought up, look at me when I talk to you, especially if you're in trouble. And they were taught, don't ever look at somebody in the eye when you're in trouble because now you're putting insult on top of injury. But as soon as that was explained, the whole reaction to that was filled with education and a much more appropriate response. So yes, we do need some training in those areas. Uh, it is not just happening by osmosis. There are a lot of things that go into becoming a much better classroom teacher uh, with a diverse population, and our teachers want to do it. And they are doing it, and they'll do it even better. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. How can the district deal with race-related issues in the schools? Two minutes, starting with Sarah. <clears throat> I think that we all, um, know that um, 
Sheboygan Area School District is uh, minority majority in our school district. Um, we have to be aware of that. We have to be open to other cultures, the other, other ways that they celebrate holidays, um, how they engage with each other. Um, what the Sheboygan Area School District is doing, I, I, the first thought of mine comes is shared in school, where they integrate the dual language at that school. Um, and if you haven't been there, I encourage you to be there. Um, how wonderful it is, the engagement between the parents and the teachers, because the parents um, are present and they are engaged, um, it is simply amazing. Um, and that staff at that school understands the cultural diversity. Um, Sheboygan Area School District understands what it is to be diverse. Um, and I, I encourage everyone to um, look in, in, into maybe visiting Sheridan School um, and, and a lot of our other schools where we welcome diversity. Haley. Can you repeat the question? How can, how can the district deal with race-related issues in the schools? Uh, I'm gonna be a little bit repetitive here, but I mentioned before that um, no matter what demographic difference, students should be treated the exact same way as every other student. Um, that goes for teachers as well, because I know this, I'm not naive enough to think that this is just a student problem. I know that it's a teacher problem as well. And I think that you know, no matter what differences, there needs to be the same opportunities and there needs to be the same treatment. And I think it's pretty simple. Thank you. Okay. Heidi. First of, all. <laughs> First of all, we need to acknowledge that there are issues with race relations in our schools. I drive carpool, so I can tell you that there are kids criticized for their hair texture by other kids in our school. There are kids criticized for the kind of food they bring in their lunches. Um, that um, all the problems haven't solved, haven't been solved. We are not at a, a post-racial um, place in here in town um, or in this country, and we still need to actively train our children and teach them that compassion and empathy and respect um, are the foundations of our school community. Thanks, Julie. Oh boy, this is a big issue. So, um, gosh, I have so much to say about this. So, first of all, I think we're where we're at right now with um, race because of where things have taken a road in our country. And so um, I'm gonna go a little Morgan Freeman on this, just real simple, right? If um, we stop calling him a black man, he'll stop calling me a white woman, right? So I think, first of all, let's start, stop separating us by the color of our skin. Um, as far as, you know, kids teasing kids, we're never gonna stop that. They have to learn, they have to feel that, you know, I feel bad, oh my gosh, I made this child feel bad. You know, they, we learn that, that's how we learn, that's how we got to where we are today. Um, we've all done things or said things that weren't respectful or weren't very nice or kind to somebody else um, and we felt that and learned from it and didn't do it again. Um, so I think I have, I, I kind of have mixed feelings about, you know, interfering with social emotional learning and kind of, you know, interjecting into their, um, into their psych. Let's let them be who they are. Um, so that's, yeah. that's how I feel about that. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'd like to start by saying I'm a proud parent of a Sheridan kid. Uh, we made the specific effort to school choice our youngest to Sheridan because we wanted her in the dual language program and she has made lifelong friends uh, as a part of that experience. So thank you to Sheridan uh, and the good work you do. Uh, we have race related issues in our school. 
if we don't admit that, we can't work on it. So I think the first step is to say, yes, we have an issue. Uh, is it a horrible issue? Does it completely disrupt the school? Absolutely not. But there are aggressions toward people that hurt and we can't ignore them and we can't act like they don't matter because they do. It's not just kids being kids. We as the leaders in a building, teachers, staff, head custodian, I don't care who, the adults in that building have to stand up and say, we are not tolerating this. This is unacceptable behavior. Racism is not allowed here. What you say at home, I cannot control. But what you say in school, I can, and you're gonna stop it. And, and I, I, I'm not kidding, I've had it with it. Um, and as the parent of a child of color, my kid experienced it in high school, and I didn't like it very much. And so it's one of the reasons I think that we need all our parents to come and participate and be a part of things. And parent engagement is not as high in some schools as we would like. So I think one of the biggest things we could do to address that issue is to get some of our underserved and disenfranchised parents into our school and appreciate the culture that they come from. We are not all white, we are not all Christian, we are not all anything. We're a wide variety of people and that's what makes this experience so valuable and rich. Mm -hmm. I, I, I have zero tolerance for racism, I just, I can't. So, okay. thank you. David. Thank you. Uh, uh, my thoughts are this, I, I think we should continue to apply uh, standards and opportunity equally to all races. I think we do that. We should find ways of communication where different races can share their experiences, possibly empathize, empathize, learn and understand each other. Uh, if there are any teachings like critical race theory that might enter into the discussion or the classroom that promote racist views, that minorities are oppressed because of their skin color, I, I think those things should be addressed immediately. Thank you. Next question. <clears throat> Charters, charter schools do not compete with regular schools. Every charter school has a contract which can be canceled by the district. The qualifications for charter school teachers are different than for regular district teachers. So should the salaries for charter school teachers be less? And how much funding should the district give to charter schools? You have two minutes, starting with Haley. This is an interesting question. <laughs> um, I actually went to a charter school for a while, so that um, I honestly, I'm, not, I'm just gonna be really transparent. I, I don't know. I, I would love to learn more about it, but I, I really don't know. So, thank you. Okay, Heidi. I also wasn't aware that uh, staff is paid differently at the different schools and I wasn't aware that there are different qualifications for charter school uh, teachers versus teachers elsewhere in the district. I do know um, I'm a really proud parent of a kid in one of our charter schools and it has been the absolute right choice for that child to have that learning experience. So I value their teachers so, so highly. Um, as to their funding being different, I, I can't answer that. I just don't have enough information. Thanks. Okay, Julie. But can you repeat the question, please? Charter schools do not compete with regular schools. Every charter school has a contract which can be canceled by the district. The qualifications for charter school teachers are different than for regular district teachers. Therefore, should the, should the salaries for charter school teachers be less? And how much funding should the district give to charter schools? Two minutes. So, okay, I will not need two minutes, thank you. Go ahead. Because I, as well, am not um, aware of this topic. Um, can you, how is the, I guess I, I'd like to know how their qualifications are different between a regular public school and the charter school. What do you mean the, the qualifications are different? I'm not here to answer questions. Got you, sorry, thank you. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I, I would I would need to learn more about that and research that. So I'm sorry, I don't have an answer for okay. that question. Thank you. All right, okay. We have eight charter schools in this district. Uh, they allow for choice on a level that no other district in Sheboygan County can touch. 
I have to tell you, honestly, as a regular, regular public uh, school teacher at first, I was not that happy about charter schools. I was concerned. Uh, but over time, they've won me over. Uh, and I have visited num a number of them, and I substitute taught in some of the etude group. And what I came away with is these kids are getting what they need. And these parents are able to place their children where they think they will be more, most successful. For example, I recently went to the Sheboygan Leadership uh, Academy, which is downtown, and I'd never been inside the building. Uh, and when I walked in, I was like, this place is cool. And the teachers, they keep the same kids all the way through eighth grade. And then they go to high school. And I think that might not be the worst idea for middle school, which is often the toughest uh, time in kids' lives, that they're with people that have known them since they were littles and moved through it. So I think charter schools do a good job. Uh, the budget issues, they, they set their own budget. If they choose within the allocation to pay their teachers more, I am all in favor of teachers making more money. So if that's what they choose to do with their money, that's what they'll do. But they do their own budgets. Uh, they come to us for approval. We sign a contract. Uh, we just did that with uh, Lake Country Academy. They're getting great results. The only reason we would cancel a contract would be if the kids were not getting the education that they need. Um, or if it just became so small a program like uh, the Montessori program out in Cleveland. But otherwise, I think, I think they're a vital part of our school district. Parents like them. The kids who go there are successful. They've won me over. Thank you. Mm. David. Uh, I would have to say I can learn a lot from Kay about this one, and uh, I am really not aware enough of all of that, the ins and outs of all that to answer, and uh, I would definitely have to learn more about it first. Thank you. All right. Sarah. I would have to mimic what Kay also stated. Um, I, I wasn't a big fan of charter schools. Um, actually, one of my best friends growing up from James Madison, um, she sends her children to Lake Country Academy. Um, and I had a conversation. I said, why, why, why that school? Um, you know, why, why did you send them to that school? And she opened up to me st uh, stating it's a different type of learning environment for her kids. Um, and, and to me, a parent allowing to make that decision, which we do in this school district, the parents make their decision of their kids' education, um, is priceless. Um, they are very successful. She is very happy with the engagement of that school. Um, and I've, I, I've heard that from other, other uh, charter schools also. Um, I, I do have a little bit cause of concern because I know that uh, they don't allow everyone you have to apply. So I'm scared that maybe they don't allow everyone um, who applies to enroll in their school district or their school. So that is a little, um, concerning to me. Um, the, the other um, caveat to that is um, they are still technically part of Sheboygan Area School District, so they do get funding from us. Um, I, I'm more concerned about the voucher schools. Um, just in Sheboygan, uh, Sheboygan Area School District, uh, we sent $4.6 million over to them, taxpayer dollars. Um, those funds, um, I've never heard of any other public sector that sends their funds over to a private sector. Uh, we don't do that for fire, we don't do it for police, and we're doing it for public schools. Um, th that's what really concerns me because we are not, as taxpayers, putting that money into public, public schools. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. What should the district do to ensure the safety of students while in school? Would you support funding to make classrooms more secure, as has been done in some schools? Two minutes, starting with Heidi. Yes. Uh, yes, I would support funding to make our school, our classrooms more secure and our schools more secure. I see that that is already happening. There's only one door to get in into any school and you have to buzz in. Um, if they have a resource officer, they're uh, near the front of the building during much of the day, especially when kids are coming and going. Um, it is really intense to be a parent right now when our kids have active shooter drills. 
uh, that the first time when your kid comes home and talks about who got to hide in the front of the closet and who had to be in the back is, is really, really intense. And I, I would throw any money I had personally into keeping our, our kids safer in their buildings. Thanks. Thanks. Julie? Um, thank you. Mary Jo, can you repeat the question, please? Thank you. What should the district do to ensure the safety of students while in school? Would you support funding to make classrooms more secure, as has been done in some schools? Thank you. Yeah, that's a great um, and important question. Um, so I would support um, safer, I, I mean, it's been like that for a while, I think, at a lot of schools where there's a, a kind of like a ring doorbell where you buzz to get in and they see, see who the person is. So I don't think that people should just, uh, doors should be open and anybody can walk in. Um, as far as the drills go, um, I kind of like a, more of a holistic approach to that. I'm not really a big fan of the Alice training. Um, I'm a fan of the teachers being um, prepared for that, but not the students. That's scary. That's that's really scary. I, I'm not I'm not a fan. I know um, a district where they they do take a more holistic approach, and that they are confident that their teachers are the ones that are trained, and they will be able to take care of the students in the event that there would be an active shooter, which is a horrible thing to to even fathom. But yes, be be prepared for it as far as having, um, you know, school doors locked, maybe uh, the the shatterproof glass. I'm assuming that we have that. I, I don't know. I guess I never checked into that. And then um, I'm also in favor. Yeah, we definitely should have uh, an officer at our, at our schools. So that's it. Thank okay. you. Okay. Recently, Sheboygan Area School District invested $2 million in building security. We took some of the grant money that we had and we did the best that we could with it. And I'm, I'm very pleased with the result. Uh, we changed glass and windows. Uh, we rekeyed. When I started teaching, I used to have to go out in the hallway to lock my classroom. When you rekey a whole school like that, it's pretty pricey, but it's super safe because uh, you can lock that door without putting yourself out there at risk and you can do it very quickly. Um, the SROs are doing a good job in our middle schools and our two high schools, the major high schools. We only have five of them though. So I do believe that the police training coming into all the buildings is helpful. Uh, it sounds like a really simple thing, but they do a very good job of telling children, do not let someone else in the building. Now, you know, we were raised to be helpful. So a little kid is walking down the hallway and here's an adult pounding on the, the window. They go and open the door. Oh, no, no, honey, we don't do that. Mm. You know, so those are things that we never had to say before, but we do now. So continuing uh, education of our kids about keeping themselves safe and also about if you see something, say something with the kids. There was a tragic incident a little while ago where a six-year-old shot his teacher. <clears throat> Six years old. Not in this school district. But that was a pivotal moment for my daughter who teaches six-year-olds. You know, she said, I, I never had to think about that in that way, she goes, but it could have happened to me. So, you know, if you see a kid doing something that's a little sketchy, tell your teacher. We're all in this together and have parents do the same thing, working together with the school, with the kids to create a safe environment. And if we need to spend a little more money to do that, I'm all for it. Mm. David? I would like to participate in ongoing discussions, which there are, uh, about safety issues. I like the idea that there's just one way or one door to get into each school. I believe that should be staffed by an armed officer. As I understand it, uh, some teachers have decided to use conceal and carry. So um, I would support all of that. Thank you. Okay. Sarah. Um, Recently, um, I did a visit tour to Horseman, and I was able to uh, engage with the SRO there. Um, and we all should care about our children's safety. Um, and it shouldn't be about how much we have to pay for it. We need our children to be safe. Um, but within that visitation, um, I, I was a little taken back um, 
the SRO was in full um, uniform. Um, when I was in high school, the SROs were not in full uniform. They were in regular clothes, they had a concealed weapon. Um, and we just have to be a little bit of understanding that some of our students are not comfortable in situations like that. Not all children are comfortable with having a full dressed uh, officer in the school. Um, I wouldn't mind going back to the way that it was um, when Mr. Christensen would walk around and we knew him and he knew our name and she definitely didn't knew the same thing too um, at Horseman. Um, but I also am on the school board and we did, as Kay said, we just approved uh, $2 million in upgrading our camera footage um, throughout the whole school district. So I definitely approve of, of spending money for the safety of our children. Haley. Thank you, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I also definitely approved <laughs> uh, for spending money for the safety of our children and I know the way that we kind of all went was, um, you know, active shooter situations which being 13 years old and you're in a classroom and we have Alice drills and there are five students having a panic attack because they're scared of small spaces and loud noises and dark rooms and people yelling to go run. <laughs> that That's not a super good situation to be in and it's super sad that that is what our world has come to. Um, but going kind of off the act, active um, shooter situation and this is gonna be a little bit uncomfortable and this is not typically vernacular that I would like to use and it's not stuff that I wanna hear but we have things happening in our schools. Um, Titty Touch Tuesday, Slap Ass Friday, those are in our school districts. What about the safety of those kids? I mean, <laughs> there are people walking around and that is an okay thing. Um, first time it happened, I was 11 years old and a group of my girlfriends, we called it Three Sweatshirt Tuesday. That's unacceptable. So maybe let's take some accountability for that. And um, yeah, thank you. Okay. Next question. <clears throat> How should the district approach discipline and bullying? And what should the role of the school resource officers be? Two minutes, starting with uh, Julie. Okay. Sorry, I'm just trying. I'm, how should the district approach discipline and bullying? Is that the question? How should the district approach discipline and bullying? and what should the role of school resource officers be? All right, so yeah, I think that, um, you know, I, if it's, uh, if a child has been proved to be a, an active bullier of a, of a student, um, there should definitely be discipline and how the resource officer, officer should help. Um, I mean, I know this from my youth. I know this from having older kids. Uh, we, you know, um, Bruce Christensen was a great mentor. Roger Jones was a great mentor. Um, so I, I think in the event that it gets to that, stage, then yes, they should be referred to the resource officer and be called in for a meeting. Also, their parents should be notified. This shouldn't be just between the student and the resource officer. I think that um, the parents should also be notified. Mm -hmm. Thank Kay. you. We have two good programs that we use in our school district to try to address this sort of thing. One is called PBIS, which stands for Positive Behavior and Intervention Supports. Takes a lot to learn that. Uh, I had to write it down. Uh, the other one is called restorative justice. And I, as a teacher, worked with PBIS when I did a long-term sub at Jackson School, which was quite an eye-opener for a high school teacher. They're whole different people at the elementary level. Uh, bless their teachers for the patience. Uh, and restorative justice came after my teaching time, but the people that I've talked to who have used it, even the ones who were somewhat cynical at the start, say they've seen really good results. And the essence of restorative justice is you as the person who was harmed and the person who did some harm to you, and it could be bullying, it could be something else. You with some guidance with other people, there's a restorative justice circle, and it works its way around to the point where the person who hurt someone else has to own that. They have to take responsibility for that. And they have to make an active decision and move 
to repair that relationship. Um, a lot of old school discipline threw kids out of school. You're suspended. That didn't necessarily teach that kid a whole lot about having a better relationship when he or she came back to the classroom. So if you're trying to build a culture, you have the people who would in this case be the bullies and the people who were bullied having to deal with each other. And that's not easy. It takes a lot of effort and it takes some training, uh, but they're getting good results from it. And I, I really do believe that uh, that may be the book of the future on discipline. Uh, bullying is not okay. We support good behavior in PBIS. Instead of saying all the negatives, we try to encourage the positives. Ultimately, you're responsible for what you do, but first we're gonna try to move you toward good behavior. Thank you. Okay. David. Thank you. Uh, bullying, discipline, bullying, officers should be involved in both of those. Liaison officers, I presume, uh, but as the situation would e escalate uh, more of the Sheboygan Authority. I think parents should be huge in this as well and uh, uh, to hold their children accountable for their behavior. Uh, right now, classroom disruptions seem to be unchecked at this point, so our teachers are undermined and frustrated. Thank you. Okay. Sarah? So the last couple of weeks, I have been knocking on hundreds of doors, um, talking to voters, and um, I ask them, you know, what is the one issue or a couple issues or, um, you know, what kind of praise you have for Sheboygan Area School District? And, and majority of all the conversations that I have with the voters that I'm knocking on those doors is bullying. The concern that their kids are bullying, that their kids are getting bullied. Um, and some of them feel as though, you know, the parents are not engaged in their children's lives, so there's nobody there to, um, you know, facilitate any kind of um, uh, a punishment or hold them accountable for their actions. Um, but if we look at Grant School, as Kay said, PBIS, the Positive Behavior Intention Support, um, their school is excelling tremendously. Um, the, the good news that we know from PBIS is that um, test scores are higher. Um, they get better grades. They have better attendance. Um, so we at the school district are implementing the PBIS um, and we are head on facing bullying. Um, as far as the SROs, um, I, I know that I shared a little bit before of um, some of the issues that I have with the S SROs, uh, maybe in, being full uniform. But the other aspect that um, concerns me is, when I was in school, we had the same police officer through our whole elementary, middle, high school. And unfortunately, these students are making relationships with these officers and then they're being pulled out after a couple of years. So I would like to see those same police officers stay in those schools because they're engaging with those students. Haley. Thank you. Um, so I think I think somebody mentioned restorative justice and when I was in school we did something that sounds a lot like that. It wasn't called that. I don't really recall what it was called, but we did that and we had where there was when there was a perpetual pro when there was a perpetual problem, oh that's a tongue twister. <laughs> um, when there was a perpetual problem, then they would have a couple students sit down, there would be, you know, for lack of better words, the offender and the one that is being bullied, um, they would sit down and they would have a discussion and um, this wouldn't be like a one and done thing, this would be a continued thing throughout weeks and there would be other people in the conversation and at times where the bullying was too uncomfortable for the person who was being bullied, then it was dealt with like by teachers and um, like without the victim in that setting. Also, I think that the second that a teacher knows that bullying is happening, the parents should be being told. <laughs> um, when I was in middle school, their parents weren't told, like we would have issues with bullying and um, we would go to the guidance counselor and our parents didn't get called. And you know, maybe there's teachers, at, maybe there's parents at home wondering, you know, why, are, why is my student misbehaving? Why are they, um, you know, secluding themselves? And maybe that's why and they don't even know. So I think that open, open communication can really be helpful as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Heidi. <clears throat> um, 
Kay did had a really good explanation of restorative justice, and I wanted to add to the PBIS explanation. It's based on the premise that the carrot is more effective than the stick in addressing misbehavior. And the when classrooms set up clear expectations that bullying will not be tolerated, um, we have a foundation to move forward. Um, when it comes to discipline, PBIS is suggesting that we start with that carrot. And I must say the resource officer needs to be the very last, the very last person involved because that's the stick. And when we're working with the carrot, we're getting our parents involved, we're getting the school counselor involved, the teacher, the administrator, all the people that can help motivate and reward behavior that is successful. Um, I am glad we have resource officers. I'm glad that we have them there for the safety of the students. But it, when it comes to student behavior, I think that is absolutely the last line. Um, until they are trained in social and emotional learning, until they are trained in de-escalation techniques, and until they are trained in cultural understanding, they have a different position than the people who are trained to inter interact with our kids. I would love to see more training for um, our resource officers. Thanks. Next question. What role should the arts and music play in curriculum requirements? Two minutes, starting with Kay. I think art and music and theater and dance and all of those things are probably right up there with the most lifelong skills we can possibly share. Uh, they are not frills. They are not extras. They are part of developing a well-rounded human being who's going to have more joy in his or her life. So I, I really strongly support them. Uh, I believe we've done some good things in our school district, but we've also cut back on some things when I wasn't real comfortable with that because of budget concerns. Uh, John Michael Kohler Arts Center in this community is an absolute gem. The opportunities to have our kids go to the Art Center, have programs through the Art Center come to our kids, phenomenal. Uh, I believe the music program is what keeps some kids in school. I believe the theater program is what keeps some kids in school. I think that that art studio class gives that kid who maybe isn't that great in math, maybe not so good in my class, English, but boy, can they do things in an art studio that I could never touch. So you see, you see the value, you see the, the interest, and uh, I strongly support continuation of funding these things because they are the, the richness of our lives uh, that we can continue to do throughout our lifetime. Thank you. David. Uh, I am just so glad that I had great musical experiences uh, in my years with Sheboygan Area School District, being in choirs and swing choirs. There's a, just an awesome social aspect that uh, benefits our children when they get involved in these kind of things. There's a creative aspect as well that's very valuable. There's also a confidence that students get when they're preparing for different presentations or solos or concerts, and uh, I appreciate all of that, and thank you. Sarah? Um, Sheboygan Area School District does an amazing job at the music um, department, the theater department. Um, I, attending, you know, South High School, I, I vividly remember um, Dr. Jacobs, you know, choir class, um, I vividly remember um, um, I'm trying to think, uh, so many teachers that helped, not through, not through math or English or, um, because those are so important too, Kay. Um, <laughs> um, but they helped in other aspects, um, I started off my singing career at church in our family choir. And when I got to high school, um, it was a form of acceptance and excitement and I looked forward to it and, and children look forward to that. And um, I think Sheboygan Air School District does such a wonderful job of this. Um, I commend them, the teachers, the music teachers, the theater department. Um, and 
it's an outlet for our kids. I think Sheboygan Area School District does such a great job. Uh, yes, some people want to say that our kids are not equipped, um, but I believe it's 94% mm, of our, our parents believe that our children are equipped to start the future um, and are prepared for the future. So they do that with English, with theater, with choir, all of those life um, lessons and those life um, practical skills, they give us that at Sheboygan Area School District. Thank you. Haley? Can you repeat the question? What role should the arts and music play in curriculum requirements? Uh, I think that arts and music are extremely important for students. Um, personally, for me, science was the reason I walked in the doors in the morning, but for a lot of other students, it was, it was art, it was you know choir, it was band, um, it was a million different things, and I think that should definitely be accessible to children. And also, just like a side note, there, we talk about how so many of our students are struggling with mental health. I mean, these are coping mechanisms that they can find through school, and um, you know, this is the hour out of the day, or however long that's going to be, this is the hour out of the day that they can just take a minute and be like, okay, I'm, I'm okay right now, and I can get through the rest of my day. So I think, it, I think it's very important. Thank you. Heidi? I love seeing more joy in our kids' day. And this is right up my alley. I have a BA in theater, and I'm a singer. Um, I was the education coordinator for the Chicago Jazz Philharmonic, and I was in charge of implementing their music-based Title I programs in Chicago public schools. I can tell you that music learning increases math success, and I wish I had those numbers in front of me, um, and reading music improves word attack and literacy, that it's not just that this is um, a, thr a frill, like, like Kay said, it is not. It is integral to learning. Thanks. Okay, Julie. Um, yes, so like Heidi, that is, that is a proven fact. The, the kiddos uh, learning an instrument makes them, makes a side of their, their brain exercise and yeah, they do better statistically in, in math. Um, so yeah, I totally support the, the arts and music um, as part of the curriculum uh, requirements. I sign me up if there's a place somewhere I'm gonna go to it. Um, I don't know if those of you that remember Titanic the, uh, Titanic the musical with uh, the captain Mitchell Tempest. <laughs> that, that, that was very fabulous. Um, no, I think it's great all the way around. It, it helps them academically, helps them emotionally, um, uh, mental health wise and it's their time where they get to be uh, creative and imagine and play dress up and do all that stuff that you know you wouldn't you wouldn't come here and play play dress up right so that's their time um, to play and be creative. Thank you. Thank you. Now, this is my last question. What is your position regarding removing books from school libraries? a practice that has come to be known as book banning. Two minutes, and we'll start with Mr. Ross. Um, <clears throat> I don't have statements prepared, but here's my thought. Um, there are a lot of books that parents, when they really find out what is in them, are very concerned that it's not educational. It's not adding to their child's education. It's, um, they're considering them to be pornography. Uh, they're very graphic. Uh, a good friend of mine today pulled his daughter out of school because a librarian presented his 11-year-old daughter with a book that detailed her mother passing out drunk on a bed while her stepfather raped her in graphic detail. And that is happening way too much. There's many, many voices who are concerned about this, and um, we need to be thinking, we need to be using good judgment and addressing that. Thank you. Sarah? Um, Sheboygan Area School District has a really great policy, and they stick to the policy very well. Um, were those books that were moved inappropriate? Yes, and I agree that they should have been moved. but. I've been knocking on doors and I'm not hearing that from the voters that I'm talking to. They're worried about um, how they're gonna put food on the table. They're worried about 
um, the bullying that goes on in school. They're worried about who's gonna take care of their children. Um, and Sheboygan Area School District realized that, hey, we can help in this, in this area. Um, and they teamed up, to, they teamed up with uh, the Boy, Boys and Girls Club and it's um, Kid Stop. We offer childcare at 6.30 in the morning until six o'clock at night. Um, so Sheboygan Area School District does a really good job when there is a problem. We, we are all looking at all avenues at different um, partners in the community to try to solve those issues. Thank you. Haley? Can you repeat the question? What is your position regarding removing books from school libraries, a practice that has come to be known as book banning? Thank you. Um, I think that if there is sexually explicit material, if there's inappropriate material in these books, then they shouldn't be in our schools. I, I don't really think it's that hard. And if there is a policy in place at our schools, I would love to know what it is that led in um, these books that were found that I mean, it's over-sexualization of minors. It's extremely inappropriate, and it's detrimental to the mental health of these kids. You know, some of these kids are already coming from abusive homes, you know, whether it's sexual abuse, whether it's physical abuse, whether it's emotional abuse. These are triggers. These books are triggers. They get into the library. They can read these books, and at the end of the day, this is a life-or-death situation, and we talk about our suicide rates, and we talk about our mental health rates skyrocketing, and this can be a huge contribution to that. Um, I know that if you know, I'm just so glad that when I saw these books that I was far enough removed from my situation, from um, my childhood, that I wasn't triggered by it. But I mean, these are these are really young kids. I mean, I, I feel like I'm young and I don't wanna look at it. And I know adults that don't wanna look at it. And if it makes them feel uncomfortable, it doesn't belong in our schools. Thank you. Heidi. Um, I think the district's responsibility is to have a process and a policy in place, and I'm not yet on the board, but it's my understanding that they do have a process and a policy in place on what to do if a complaint is made about a book, and that there should also be a process and policy in place for that book to be reviewed on whether it not or not it should be returned to, a libra to the library. And I'm not talking about the books that have um, come up recently. I'm also talking about books that are popular targets of book banning, which are books about the Holocaust, which are books about other historical events. And we can't pretend that the situation is just um, about um, recent, recent events. Um, I I'm glad to know that there is a policy in place and I, I would like to see um, how it can be tightened and improved. And I think that is a great place to take community and parent and teacher um, suggestion on um, looking at what the policy is and how we can tighten it up. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Julie. Yes, thank you. That is a really great question. Um, so I, I guess I, I would like to know the policy on how did these books end up in the library in the first place? Who makes those decisions? How did, you know, so that would be my first question because these books uh, that I'm talking about that I saw get removed from um, South High School was, I, I was shocked actually. Um, so I, I, I'm on board with this book banning thing for something like gender queer. When you have a book that our local news station cannot even show the images? Why is that in our minor children's library? Um, so yeah, to, I, I don't know. I, that was unacceptable. Um, and then the, the other thing, um, are some of these books being used in our curriculum? You know, we talk about somebody maybe being really scared about an officer being in full dress. Why is that? You know, we have a book called The Hate You Give as part of a curriculum. I know a student who's extremely uncomfortable um, with that book. So um, I guess I wouldn't be opposed to it being in the library, but you know, maybe that, that reason for a student would be why they're afraid of an officer in full dress. 
Um, I think we should be, our kids should be fearful of law enforcement, but also respectful of them and know that they're there to help. They're there to keep us safe. They shouldn't be feared. We shouldn't be teaching them to fear them. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Mm uh, the policy on, on book banning is school board policy 2523. So if you want to look it up and take a close examination of how it works, but I will tell you we followed the policy. The initial part of the policy says if there is a complaint, the library specialist, media specialist, and the principal in that building have a meeting and they decide whether they're going to move forward or not. At South High School, uh, the principal made the decision to pull the three books that were actual graphic novels as in illustrations. Uh, and I think it was the illustrations that really up, were very upsetting and I understand why. Uh, but to, to move that more forward and try to remove books that are controversial, like, oh, I don't know, banned books lists have Hatcher in the Rye and they have uh, to Kill a Mockingbird, and they have a lot of the great classics of literature. Just because pe some people don't like the content, that's, that's too far. If you don't want your child to check out that book, don't let them check out the book. Make them return it. As far as in curriculum, if there's something that's being used that you don't approve of, you always have the right as a parent to ask for an alternate. That is always going to be available to you and your family. Um, I believe that we should end on a positive note. So here we go in my 30 seconds left. Do you know that we offer 40 AP classes in the Sheboygan Area School District? Do you know that we just entered into something, a contract with Lakeland College, where if you take advantage of what's available, your kid can get two years toward college free. Think of how much money that saves your family. Do you know that we offer 19 industrial licenses? We do a youth partnership with uh, Lakeshore Technical College. Our kids build a house that I would put up against anybody and they get trained by contractors and they have a job before they even graduate. There's so much good. Let's not get caught up in the negative. Let's move forward. And if we want to attract good teachers, we can do it by saying good things. Thank you all. We, will we are going to conclude um, tonight's forum with a closing statement from each candidate. You will have one minute and we're gonna start with Sarah. My name is Sarah Ruiz Harrison and I'm currently on the Sheboygan Area School District Board. I wanna thank the AAUW for creating this space for us, for the community to come and hear us. I wanna go ahead and thank Heidi, Julie, Kay, David, and Haley for being up here. Um, our kids deserve a board who is willing to tackle all the complex issues that impact a quality learning environment. We want all of our students to reach their full potential. I am here because I know how to bridge all aspects of the district together. I am particu particularly motivated to create more engagement from all of our diverse communities. Parent and teachers working together is the reason why we have 25 different schools in our school district. Listening to parents and teachers has resulted in unique learning environment for our students. I look forward to continuing to work closely with the students and the parents. Again, my name is Sarah Ruiz Harrison, and I welcome your support on Tuesday, April 4th. Haley. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank you for letting me speak tonight. It was wonderful to not only be able to share my thoughts, but to hear the thoughts of others. Today is a scary world for parents, for students, for teachers, and for most anyone. Yes, at times it is terrifying, but at times it is also beautiful, and I see that beauty when I see the next generation of this district and this community. We need to do right by these children. We need to be providing environments where they can strive and succeed and where they can be comfortable asking for help. When I was in high school, whenever things got tough, I always thought, if I can just graduate, it'll be fine. If I can just graduate, everything else will fall into place. We need to focus on graduation. I'm not saying that we don't, but we also need to focus on what happens after graduation. Are these students prepared for higher education? Are these students prepared to enter the workforce? Let's work together to make this district one that prepares students to succeed far after they're handed their diplomas. Thank you. Thank you. Heidi. I want to serve on the school board because I choose to educate my kids in SASD schools, and I want the best education for them and all the kids in our district. 
I understand that the issues are multifaceted and opinions are diverse, and I listen to various viewpoints. This job requires inquiry, research, and cooperation, and these things I do very well. Thanks to my husband and my three not so little learners for your support and engagement in my campaign, to um, my own Annie back there in the urban play, to my son who is doing his second CAP course as a sophomore, and my third son who's at home working on that ELA project. And thanks for eating the takeout because I keep forgetting to take the chicken out of the freezer on all these busy nights. Um, and thank you for the AAUW for this opportunity for the community to get to know us all better. Julie. All right. Well, this was awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, I look forward to an opportunity to serve our community's families as they entrust their precious children's well-being to the Sheboygan Area School District. Academic excellence is an absolute priority as well as ensuring a safe environment for all students at all times. I also truly believe that we are more alike than we are different, and any division-driven content needs to stop. Um, I would like to say a quote by Allison Rowe Schaefer. Perversion always targets purity, and that's why our children are being assaulted by this evil all over the world. It is on you to stand up, speak up, and protect our children. When children are involved, there is a higher calling of responsibility. That's by Allison Rowe Schaefer. So I think uh, together, I think we can make public academic instruction great again. Thank you. Kay. I appreciate this opportunity to answer your thoughtful questions because our children are our most valuable resource. This election will have a lasting impact on the high quality of our local public education. Hopefully experience, facts, and positivity will be valued over politics and fear. My 40 years of teaching experience and three years on the Board of Education have given me a deep understanding of the challenges and the opportunities of our 25 schools. I believe in our excellent professional teachers, staff, students, and parents. Together, we can do great things to ensure that all our students are successful in our schools. Thank you for listening. My name is Kay Robbins, and I would appreciate your vote on Tuesday, April 4. Thank you. David. I echo everything. Hold on. Hello. Okay. I'd have to echo and agree with uh, everything that's being said about our desire for our students. However, I believe it's our job to protect our kids from bad books, from bad curriculum that's inappropriate. Holocaust books, fine. To Kill a Mockingbird, fine. We address other needs for students. Fine, we do that. We cannot ignore the voices of concerned parents and even teachers about bad books or curriculum. It's okay for us to have a moral compass that we all live by. Yes, we can complain about books and curriculum to stop the pro but we need to stop the problem before it starts. Thank you. Thank you all very much for your participation and your willingness to serve the Sheboygan Area School District. Uh, and Dulce will have, provide some concluding remarks. Thank you, Mary Jo, for moderating the discussion this evening. And thank you to all of you candidates for participating and sharing with the voters your something about yourself and how you would approach your position as a board member of the Sheboygan Area School District. Also, thank you to Eleanor Young and Kathy Young, Kathy Lowen, <laughs> for serving as our timekeepers. And a big thank you to Scott Mela with WSCS for taping this forum and making it available throughout his schedule until the time of the election and also available on demand and WSCS Spectrum Channel 990. Thank you all for coming. Have a good evening. <laughs>